Welcome everyone to the um, ASCO Iowa Cancer Clinical Trials Virtual Roundtable today. Thanks for joining us. And I know we'll have people joining as we go here as well. Um, I feel like we have to start out by mentioning that we've been trying to have this session for a year. So this session was originally scheduled for, I believe it was early March, maybe late March of last year. And we all know what uh, was going on at that time. So it is extra exciting to uh, welcome you all here today and to welcome our guest speakers. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kelly Wells-Sittig. My pronouns are she and her. I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director at the Iowa Cancer Consortium. I wanna let you all know that today's session is being recorded so that we can plan to share that out with you and our other partners um, later. Uh, we're gonna have great information that we're gonna to wanna to share. Today, we have the lovely honor of welcoming some colleagues from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO. But first, I want to tell you that the purpose of these roundtables is to connect all of you, so cancer clinical trials researchers, stakeholders, people who um, have an advocacy interest or a passion for, cl uh, for clinical trials in Iowa and who want to ultimately help all of us work better together. By now, I would guess we're all very familiar with virtual meetings, but I know that not everyone uses Zoom specifically. So let's get familiar. It would be very helpful if, if you're on your computer, if you hovered over your picture, there are three dots in the upper corner, upper right-hand corner of your own picture. If you click on those, you will have the option to rename yourself. If you would rename yourself your preferred name and maybe your organization, if you're willing, and your pronouns, if, you, um, if you'd if you like to share your preferred pronouns, we would really appreciate that. To mute and unmute, if you're joining us on the computer, of course, is the microphone icon down in the lower left-hand corner. On the phone, it's star six nine. We will ask you to turn your cameras off during presentation time, but I hope that during discussion time and Q&A time, maybe even for a minute now, if you're willing, that you'll all be brave and turn your cameras on. We recognize it's a, it's a new work world, so if you're eating lunch um, or um, talking to your kids, that is just fine, totally understandable. Just uh, make sure you're muted, but we'd love to see your faces. You can chat using the chat box. Again, that's the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. If you would type your name, organization, and role in there, if you feel it's applicable, um, go ahead and get that a try. And then later, later after our presentation, um, our one of our research and clinical trials workgroup co-chairs, Shannon Benson, um, will be facilitating a Q&A with our speakers. And so um, she and I will be monitoring the chat box. Drop your questions as our speakers are presenting into the chat box and we'll make sure to get your questions answered when it's time. All right, um, Patricia, if you wanna go ahead and share your slides, that would be great. I am so pleased to introduce our speakers today. As I do, now is the time for everyone who is not presenting to turn your cameras off. I'll remind you when to turn them back on. Patricia Hurley is Director of Research Resources and Evaluation for the American Society of Clinical Oncology's Center for Research and Analytics. And Laura Levitt is Director of Research Analysis and Publications for the Center for Research and Analytics at ASCO. We are so thrilled after all of these months to welcome them and to benefit from their knowledge and wisdom. So Patricia and Laura, thank you so much for being here. Great, thank you for having us, it's a real honor. Should we just dive in and get started? Yep. That would okay. be great. Um, so next slide. Great. So today, um, Patricia and I are gonna talk um, about ASCO and really high level, the Center for Research and Analytics and what we do at, within Centra. And then we're gonna give an overview of some specific ASCO clinical trials initiatives, including our research road to recovery report, which relates to the pandemic, and our strategies to reduce the burden of site feasibility assessments 
And then we'll wrap up with some current key initiatives that ASCO is launching or has already launched this year and some existing ASCO resources. So next slide. So ASCO um, does quite a bit of different things related to research. Um, this slide shows some of the, the, the main buckets. So ASCO is a champion of best practices, primarily related to trial design. Um, we've weighed in on things like eligibility criteria, older adults. Um, we also do some original research within ASCO. TAPER is our clinical trial um, that's ongoing, but we do surveys. We have CancerLink, which is our big data initiative um, where we do some secondary analyses. So that makes up a, a large percentage of our portfolio of work. Um, ASCO also sees itself as a fosterer of connections and collaborations. So we often bring together various stakeholders in the research community to talk about new or emerging issues or particularly um, big problems that we think ASCO could have an impact at resolving. ASCO does quite a bit of education work through its meetings, but also we have some tools on our website for research. Um, we do some workshops, some webinars. And then ASCO is a big advocate for research, so we weigh in on emerging regulations, um, guidelines from FDA, NCI, um, as well as legislation. So next slide. So I was just going to quickly say how we do this work. Um, ASCO staff tend to put together task forces, which are made up of um, people like you, people who work within the research community, so doctors, research administrators, patient advocates. Um, so we convene these task forces to do the work, to do the research um, within ASCO. And sometimes we actually convene meetings when the world is not falling apart. Um, so um, we also have a way within Centra to do research, our surveys of the broader research community. So we do those periodically on various topics to get a, a broader, broader input on topics. Um, we have webinars, podcasts, um, our website. And then I would just say our ASCO annual meeting and our other meetings um, are obviously a, a great opportunity for connecting and, and talking about issues in research. So next slide. So the bulk of my presentation today is going to be about ASCO's Road to Recovery Report, um, which just came out in December and really lays out a vision for what we want clinical trials to look like um, as we move forward out of the pandemic. So next slide. So the goals of the report um, were to assess the major impacts of the COVID pandemic on care delivery and clinical research, and then make recommendations on how we can maintain um, some of the positive developments that have been made to clinical trials and clinical care as the pandemic recedes. So we've talked about, it's not what should be done during the pandemic, but what do we want things to look like as we move to a, a new normal or back to normal. Uh, so next slide. So the project was organized under the leadership of Skip Burris, who was um, a, a president of ASCO. And then there was really two task forces, one that looked at cancer research and one that looked at care delivery. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk mostly about the research um, task force and the recommendations that came out of that group's work. Next slide. So I quickly wanted to recognize Nate Pinnell, who is the chair um, of the task force. He's from Cleveland Clinic. But also note that we had a pretty broad group of stakeholders involved, so people from industry or people from academia, people from community centers. We had an ethicist, a statistician, a patient advocate, um, a research administrator. So we really brought together um, the views of, of lots of different people within the research environment. Um, and we also did have said industry, but we didn't have industry on the committee, um, but we, we consulted with various industry people in the development of the report, um, so their input was also a part of our thinking and development of the recommendations. So next slide. Um, so here's the report. It came out in December, um, and I think the slides will be distributed after the meeting, so it includes the link here, um, but I also just want to note there is a nice and a visual summary of the recommendations that you can also download from ASCO's website. 
Uh, next slide. So the overarching approach of the research task force, um, we identified five goals to ensure the research community builds on the COVID-19 experience really to improve equity and accessibility for patients, enhance the efficiency of trials, and then protect scientific integrity and data quality. The so next slide. So this slide presents the five goals. Um, goal one really surrounds the patient. So the goal is to ensure that clinical trials are accessible, affordable, and equitable for patients. Our second goal relates to the design of trials. So we thought that as we move forward, trials should try to be more pragmatic and efficient um, and better mirror what's um, done in routine clinical care. Goal three uh, relates to the need to streamline, simplify, standardize protocol requirements and trial operations with the goal really of minimizing administrative and regulatory burden on research sites. Our goal four is targeted at the workforce and the need to have a um, recruit, retain, and support a well-trained clinical trial workforce to support high-quality research. And then goal five um, relates to the oversight of reporting and conduct of research. So next slide. So the report makes a number of specific recommendations on what clinical trials should look like, and these are organized around the five goals that I just went over. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through the recommendations. So next slide. So goal one, again, this is the, the goal most focused on patients, making trials accessible, affordable, and equitable. Um, we point out that many of the changes adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic had a positive impact on making trials more accessible. So this, this includes things like offering remote and virtual consent, using e-signatures, um, being more flexible about accepting molecular test results from CLIA certified laboratories during care, allowing the remote administration of treatment, allowing remote patient assessments, and then limiting the need for research-only biopsies. And we recognize that we don't really know the impact of these changes. So while we recommended that they be continued based on the expectation they would be positive, we also called for evaluating the impact of changes to trials to make sure we're achieving the objectives we want. So um, looking at the making sure that we're improving the diversity of patients participating in trials, what are the actual experiences of patients, investigators, and research sites once these changes are are implemented and what is the financial impact. So next slide. So again, goal two relates to the design of trials, so designing more pragmatic and efficient trials. So the recommendations really are directly that. We should design more pragmatic trials that align with, with clinical care and have more flexibility for patient assessments. Um, we thought the precise two tool may be a way to evaluate how pragmatic trials are um, and could be used more. And then we listed some specific ways that trials could be more efficient. So using adaptive design elements, we thought there's a greater role for master protocols and that we could be using control groups um, more routinely. Next slide. So goal three uh, relates to minimizing administrative and regulatory burdens on research sites. And again, here we thought there were some positive changes from COVID that should be maintained moving forward. Um, these relate to allowing virtual, efficient, flexible options for site selection, such as feasibility assessment, pre-study site visits, for study implementation, um, so site initiation, data collection, and monitoring visits, and also using more efficient or electronic documentation and signatures. Um, we thought there was room for developing consensus on the documentation requirements for many aspects of um, conducting a trial. And then we also called for leveraging technology to improve the efficiency. So we thought there could be a more interoperable sponsor zero platforms, um, more use of e-documentation, e-signatures, electronic regulatory binders, and then more standardized templates and forms. Next slide. So goal four again relates to the workforce. Um, and here we thought we learned 
the importance from the COVID pandemic of having better cross-training and preparing our staff to work from home. Um, so we thought this is something that could be maintained moving forward. So the idea is if um, staff or physicians for a specific trial are for some reason unavailable, it would be less of a big deal because we, you know, programs would have more cross-training and other people could step in. Um, we called for standardized clinical research training, um, including human subject protection COI training. And then we thought there was a specific role for ASCO moving forward to um, provide more mentorship to both investigators and research staff interested in participating in clinical trials, but also um, at the site level. So um, we have some ongoing virtual mentoring programs in our live meetings where they could have a bigger focus on research than they do right now. Uh, next slide. So the, the last set of recommendations relate to the oversight and review of clinical trial conduct and results. Um, here we called for more use of central IRBs. We thought that ASCO might have a role in this by updating its statement and kind of laying out the importance of central IRBs to research review. Um, we recognize that during COVID, there's been a greater use of preprints and non-peer-reviewed reports. Um, so we thought that ASCO should work with medical journal editors, other um, medical societies to come up with some guidelines on how to uh, appropriately use these um, publications to inform care and, and make sure that the publications acknowledge kind of the limitations of not um, being peer reviewed and, and being more preliminary than some other types of um, research published in our journals. And then we called for um, ASCO to work with other stakeholders to ex examine the standards by which investigational oncology drugs are assessed um, to make sure that new drugs are achieving more clinically meaningful outcomes. Uh, so next slide. So just at a high level um, for 2021 related to the Road to Recovery Report, we're still in the process of disseminating it, um, such as work webinars like this one. Uh, we are starting to have some conversations with NCI, FDA, and other stakeholders about how we could start to move them forward and implement the recommendations. And then we're hoping this year um, we start actually seeing some adoption and practice changes based on the recommendations. And Patricia, at the end of her presentation, is going to go over some of the specific efforts ASCO plans on launching this year, um, some related to this report. So with that, I will thank you for your attention and turn it over to Patricia. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You can hear me? Laura nod if so. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. I'd like to um, uh, say that we appreciate your time today and the opportunity as well to share some of the work that uh, we're doing to address some of the site level challenges. Um, I think, Laura, you saw from the earlier slides that one of the key objectives um, from ASCO's perspective is to really identify some strategic initiatives that will have the greatest impact on certainly our members, um, their research teams, as well as the research community at large. Um, and as we've been advancing um, a lot of task forces initiatives that Laura mentioned, and we reach out to our members um, and get a sense of what the greatest pain points are. And I think you can all relate to the fact that a common one is um, around administrative and regulatory burdens with clinical trials. It remains an ongoing challenge. Um, the startup. Uh, the site selection and startup time alone is lengthy and burdensome, as you well know, uh, requiring many steps and months even to just get the first patient enrolled. So we convened a task force um, to explore strategies to expedite patient enrollment with a goal to have a significant impact again on sites and ultimately patient access to trials. 
So we initially started with a landscape analysis and um, to better understand what the specific challenges were and to also identify existing initiatives. We did not want to be duplicative and we wanted to really ensure that we make a change here. You, can, you are probably aware that over the past decade or so there have been many um, initiatives, some of those are listed there, to try to improve clinical trial activation processes. Um, some of them focused on establishing, standardizing, and harmonizing some of the components of uh, qualifying sites and investigators. Um, and ACRES, for example, um, proposed credentialing, has proposed and actually have underway a site credentialing um, system. Transcelerate, I suspect many of you have heard of them, and Cognizant and their shared investigator platform. And ASCO also issued um, a research statement on minimum standards and exemplary attributes of trial sites, and that was actually in response to the first item there, the NCI clinical trials working group recommendations that um, recommended a certification program or registry for trial sites. ASCO wasn't necessarily in support of that, simply because um, we thought that, one, there wasn't enough of an evidence base to know exactly what um, uh, translates into a qualified or high-performing site. But additionally, we didn't want to add to site burdens for something that, again, didn't necessarily translate into um, uh, high performance. So um, the realization as we did the landscape analysis was that it's clear that many of these initiatives that started as far back as into the early 2000s have not had their desired impact. We still hear that um, the challenges exist. So the current methods of site selection, I think these will all resonate with you. Um, they result in undue costs and burdens. Sponsors and CROs require unnecessary and duplicative information oftentimes. And all stakeholders are affected. We often hear from the site perspective, but we know that it's a lot um, of resources, et cetera, and delays for sponsors and CROs, and it delays patient access to uh, clinical trials, and certainly the prolonged startup times do that. Um, they also result in barriers to site participation in trials. Those sites with fewer resources um, you know, it makes it challenging for them to be able to afford the administrative um, and regulatory staff to be able to participate in clinical trials. So it's a real barrier, um, especially for those sites without the research infrastructure. And um, there's certainly the lack of evidence for the value and relevance with some of the requests. So some of the redundant requests or even, you know, the lengthy requests um, we don't know whether or not they really predict the success of a clinical trial site on a given trial and whether they provide assurances of patient safety and scientific integrity. So the task force, with that in mind, the task force um, set up a goal to identify strategies to reduce trial site burdens associated with industry and CRO trial site feasibility assessments. And um, you can see that we took a stepwise approach to um, uh, advanced to the point where we actually have something tangible and um, a statement with recommendations that we could release. So first I'll focus on how we gained insight in terms of um, uh, what the specific barriers were as well as some potential solutions. So we started with data collection where we conducted a site survey and also sample feasibility questionnaires. We wanted to really get our hands on the variability of what's out there. Um, and that provided some insights about the processes, the burdens, and specific pain points. Importantly, we wanted to quantify the problem. We've learned from previous work that if you can put a dollar value or, you know, some way to, to um, quantify the problem or show the magnitude of the problem, uh, that that has been really effective in the past. Uh, we held a stakeholder meeting, bringing together all stakeholders, industry sponsors, patients, sites, um, and talked about potential solutions and um, recommended improvements, um, and also talked about potential barriers to uptake of any changes. And then finally, we did a stakeholder survey um, to get feedback about the recommendations that we were proposing for process improvement. So I'm just briefly going to give a high-level overview of the site survey results. Um, the, the manuscript um, that is provided on the other uh, 
few slides earlier, similar to Laura's, um, there's a link to an overview document as well as the actual publication. And that publication um, came out in January for those who don't know. And I suspect that Kelly will put it in the um, chat box. So the um, survey we had 103 oncology practices respond. Um, the one thing that I want to highlight here is, again, that quantifying the burden. A super conservative cost estimate um, for the participants in the survey, um, so the 103 sites, was that they were spending $1.2 million per year of all sites combined on the feasibility assessment process. Very conservative estimate, as you can see at the bottom, $45 an hour for one coordinator. We know that there is much more involved at the site level, many more bodies. Um, this is, you know, we're looking at a median of 22 hours, probably way more, way more sites affected. So you can see that between the sites um, industry, CROs, that's millions of dollars per year spent on um, these feasibility assessments. So um, no surprise, most considered the feasibility questionnaires and the pre-study site visits content redundant to information they had previously provided to the sponsor and CRO or their, and or they're redundant between different sponsors and CROs. Um, so we made some recommendations for change, and um, again, the uh, publication was released, it was early January, I think that first week, seems like a lifetime ago, um, and so there's an overview document um, that was essentially a press release, and then the more detailed um, manuscript. So we... Um, the, there were three key recommendations, and these will sound familiar to the Road to Recovery recommendations. They align very nicely. So um, we wanted to, um, we recommend that the feasibility assessments are streamlined and standardized in terms of the process. Um, the questions are minimized and standardized. And this will sound familiar too, that technology is leveraged to centralize information exchange. So, and those recommendations came from the, um, the results, based on the results of the uh, survey, as well as the um, in-person meeting. So, for the first recommendation to streamline and standardize the process, the goal is to reduce the burdens and inefficiencies uh, with the feasibility assessment process, minimize questionnaires, correspondence, in-person visits, and adopt best practices. Um, and we note some best practices for industry and CROs as well as uh, for sites, establishing some SOPs, for example. And then minimizing and standardizing questions make it easier for sites to respond efficiently with accurate and consistent information. Minimize the questions and reduce the variation across um, sponsors, trials, et cetera, um, standardizing questions and response options. And then finally, the leveraging technology, improving efficiency, centralizing information exchanges, and expediting clinical trial startup. So those platforms, such as the Transcelerate one, um, you know, that would be one example. However, there are many competing ones nowadays um, that we'll talk about in a second. So I'm not going to go through these in great detail, um, but you can see that the report the statement is outlined like this, and the shaded are more detailed specifics. Um, so for this, for the process changes, um, again, streamlining, make it uniform across sponsors and CROs. You'll see in the manuscript that there are three tables that are pretty detailed in terms of what we're recommending for the process and the best practices for the um, sponsors, CROs, as well as site recommendations. So this is a busy looking slide, but um, there's a reason. So the, the, on the far left there, you can see that the typical process is a long feasibility questionnaire and a pre-study site visit. Many of you are probably shaking your head yes at this uh, particular juncture. And um, we're recommending one of three options for sponsors and industry, or uh, CROs. So the first option, is asking sites to complete a short feasibility questionnaire, five to 10 questions. 
and then a pre-study site visit. Option two is a long feasibility questionnaire only, so probably what sites are mostly getting right now, those longer questionnaires up to 70 items. Um, and then option three is a pre-study site visit or teleconference only, and those would likely be in situations where sponsors and CROs have uh, previously worked with the site. So um, with the stakeholder survey, so we once we came up with those the process recommendations, we reached out to the stakeholders and got some feedback, and you'll see that most of the respondents were academic sites, um, then community-based sites, and then sponsors and CROs. We didn't have a whole lot of um, feedback from CROs, so we acknowledged that as a limitation. Um, but it was interesting that most of the respondents preferred option one, which was the short feasibility questionnaire and a pre-study site visit, virtual or in-person. And then if there was a prior relationship, the option three was okay. And the greatest benefits you can see listed there on the left in point form, time savings, expedited startup, fewer staff resources, and cost savings, and the greatest barriers were buy-in from sponsors and CROs, probably not a whole lot of surprise there, and information or insufficient information about the site capabilities. That was um, feedback, obviously, from the sponsors and CROs. So the second recommendation was to um, minimize and standardize the feasibility questions with common nomenclature, questions and response options, but also to ask the minimum necessary questions. And again, there's a table that really goes into detail of what that should look like. And then the third recommendation, leveraging technology. So this would be a universally accessible and accepted database and portal to centralize feasibilities, um, feasibility assessments, improve efficiencies, and expedite um, startup. So um, clearly the centralization, accessibility is important. What we also acknowledge, which I think is lacking, or we thought was lacking in many of the existing systems, is the lack of integration with um, current data and the ability for um, sites to be able to upload their information rather than having to enter it manually and so forth. So more integration is recommended. And then also ensuring that they're consistently referenced by sponsors and CROs within um, and between. And in the meantime, we're, we suggested that a universal and standardized site pro profile and capabilities form would be important. <clears throat> and again, in table six in the manuscript, it really lays that out further and um, shows, also demonstrates some of the deficiencies in existing systems. So some of the key takeaways. Um, no doubt here that the uh, current feasibil feasibility assessment process is costly, inefficient, inconsistent, labor intensive, and an un of uncertain effectiveness. And importantly, it's not sustainable, especially for those smaller sites. And immediate actions that we identified for sponsors and CROs include accepting a standardized and brief site capabilities document, minimizing the need for in-person site visits, providing sufficient information about the protocol to enable sites to provide accurate information, providing a single point of contact who is knowledgeable about the pro protocol and investigational therapy, and all stakeholders stand to benefit from these recommendations. Uh, we noted that further work is needed to establish consensus on and adoption of the standardized questions forms core criteria for a qualified clinical trial site and a centralized feasibility assessment database and portal, and importantly, <clears throat> to have meaningful impact, it's essentially to have uh, widespread adoption and consistent execution of these recommendations across all stakeholders. So our next steps are to disseminate um, across the research community stakeholders and collaborate with site sites, industry, CROs to ensure widespread adoption. And we encourage all of you to spread the word, help us spread the word. So the current priority initiatives um, at ASCO, we've got, we just completed a, um, an oral adherence barriers and solution workshop. Um, 
there's a collaboration underway right now with ACCC uh, to increase representation of patients from racial and ethnic minority groups in clinical trials. And we also have initiative underway to increase patient and site access to and participation in trials. And we also have um, resources for research sites. Some of you may or may not be aware of those. Uh, we have a library to facilitate conducting and managing, or with resources to facilitate conducting and managing trials. And some examples are listed there from, from building a research program to making the case for oncology research to staffing retention and workload. Again, I'm sure a lot of these issues resonate well with you. Um, and we also have a series of ASCO research statements, including the one I just described, um, adverse event reporting. We have uh, some guidance there, as well as broadening eligibility criteria. And we have an online uh, research forum as well, and COVID-19 resources. And they're all accessed by these links that you'll uh, receive um, th through the handout, as well as by or via ASCO.org. So feel welcome to contact us. I put all of our uh, um, emails here, and including the general one. In case you don't remember our names, you certainly remember research at ASCO.org. And finally, I'd just like to thank you for your time again today. Wow, I think that was excellent. I know, I don't know if I filled out that site survey, but if I did not, that definitely hit the mark for exactly the way that I feel as someone who opens trials and feels administrative burden and regulatory burden. So thank you to Laura and Patricia, that was excellent. Um, my name is Shannon Benson, and I would love for everybody to turn on their cameras um, and we'll get some Q&A going. I am watching the chat box so you can enter uh, any messages you have into the chat and I'll try and prompt some questions as well just to get discussion going if we don't have any right away. Um, I am the Executive Director of Iowa Oncology Research Association and I am the Administrator for the Iowa-wide NCOR, which is a uh, funded site in at the National Cancer Institute. It looks like we have one question already. So this is from Jeanette. Hello, Jeanette, I know you. Um, how long do you think it will take for these changes to hit the boots on the ground staff? That was exactly one of the things I was wondering too, uh, time frame or even just realistic um, expectations for sites. Yeah, I think that's a really <laughs> great question and uh, would be lovely if we had the answer. I think what we've learned along the way is that um, dissemination is key. So trying to identify strategies such as connecting, you know, with this group and, um, you know, it's the whole people disseminating amongst their network. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about, the task force has been talking about is, um, uh, you know, um, even within your own networks, disseminating it, but also as far as the feasibility assessments, for example, um, to really, for sites to, to encourage sites to refer to the recommendations and kind of push back or challenge in a obviously friendly way, um, industry and CROs with, you know, ASCO's recommended these strategies, why or why not, um, uh, implement them. So having that conversation more, I think, is also going to help. But dissemination, I think, is really key and um, encouraging kind of everyone working together, the whole research community, to really try to um, make this change happen. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, for the road to recovery, I mean, ASCO has been talking about it internally as it's our roadmap for our work with, related to research over the next two to three years. So I think, you know, our, I don't know that that gives a timeline on when things will kind of be changed in the clinic, um, but it is where we're going to be spending our efforts in the immediate near term um, to try to make some changes. So hopefully it does result in actual improvements in research. Yeah, and I think the collaborations as well. So I think all of you know that bringing FDA 
to the table is really important, and NCI for that matter, um, mm -hmm. because that's where change can happen. And we've had certainly that stakeholder meeting, and for most of our initiatives, we have some kind of stakeholder meeting where everyone's at the table and having the conversation. It was interesting to hear FDA's responses to some of the assumptions that and practices that industry and CROs had been making, um, assuming that it was required, and in fact it wasn't. So I think that will also uh, be really effective to collaborate and learn more. Great, thank you. Um, just some, a couple of questions that I had when I had looked through the site slides ahead of time. Um, you know, you talked about the importance of recruiting, retaining, finding those well-trained uh, staff. Um, I know one of the ideas, and this is something that I could see, you know, would be necessary during a pandemic is allowing for remote administration of treatment. So were there concerns about how, when you're allowing that, you're still ensuring a qualified workforce? Mm. Yeah, I guess I, I could, I can try to start. Um, so, I mean, I think we've seen during COVID more remote administration of treatment. Um, and like I said, ASCO sees that as a positive development just because it does make it easier for patients to participate on trials, um, makes it less burdensome them. But we are calling for that to be, you know, to do, evaluate the impact of that change to make sure it's not deteriorating the quality of the trials or hurting patients in some way. So I think maybe there's just a lot of unknowns, um, but in general, we're seeing it as a positive development. You know, Patricia, if you had anything you wanted to add about the work. Yeah, I think um, I would agree with uh, what Laura just said. And I think the only thing I would add is that one of the things that we're planning to do as part of that initiative about increasing site access and patient access to trials um, will be doing, and we'll encourage any of you to uh, participate, but we'll be doing um, some outreach to sites to better understand the challenges, what worked well and what didn't, workforce, um, logistics, otherwise, um, with the remote access and um, enabling patients to receive care locally or, you know, labs or um, what have you. So we'll be exploring more of that to better understand what works well and what doesn't and what could um, what strategies could be developed. We did hear, um, I think, that w with regards to the workforce, which was interesting during the um, uh, feedback that we've received uh, and certainly talking with the task force with the road to recovery work, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this where um, the, one of the greatest challenges was when staff were sent, and Shannon, I think you were um, mentioning this previously, where staff um, nurses, for example, had to go to work on patients with COVID or were um, moved elsewhere be because, um, you know, things had to be restructured or there were staffing issues. So that uh, the one of the greatest challenges was patient or uh, staff being able to step in on a moment's notice. And I think that's an area as well that, um, you know, we hope that somehow we can uh, not necessarily just ask go, but that, that some strategies are developed around that, including training. Yeah, and I guess we might learn, you know, I think as we do this more, we'll probably learn what context and in what, you know, with what drugs or what treatments or what you know, where it's appropriate to have remote administration of treatment and maybe there's some context where it's really not appropriate. So I think we just need to keep learning from the experiences we're having right now. Okay, I'm still monitoring the chat box. I don't see anything new. So I'm, I'm gonna throw another tough question out about e-consenting, um, you know, trying to, get a true informed consent um, and, and ensuring that you're getting that using either an e-consent or doing it over the phone, um, you know, via Zoom, however, you know, that looks, um, you know, what challenges or concerns were there from the group about, I mean, did the FDA, NCI, any, 
or was there any feedback on how how to do that correctly or concerns that it's not as you know effective as doing it in person yeah i would say we've been having a lot of discussions internally about an ASCO kind of beyond the initiatives Patricia mentioned about what should ASCO focus on and e-consent has been kind of top of the list. So I think it's an area where we might be doing some kind of research or surveys, you know, to find out what sites are saying or the challenges or, you know, or what are the pros and cons of doing e-consent and then um, deriving some kind of recommendations or lessons learned. So I think that's definitely an area of great interest for ASCO where we're, I think we're like very likely to do some further work. Um, but if people on the phone have things they'd like to share now, that would also be helpful or to email us afterwards. I can speak anecdotally um, mm -hmm. that there are some, you know, we are finding some benefits to this. Um, you know, when you meet with the patient in an exam room, you know, prior to their consult, after an intense consult, Sometimes they, they may sign the consent and they may feel like they understood it, but they may be so overwhelmed with the information from the physician, you know, that again took place before the consent process or after that sometimes they truly aren't giving an informed consent, even though they feel like they are, you know, versus doing it, you know, right now our process when we're doing it remotely is, you know, mailing them the consent, allowing them ample time to read through it, really jot down notes, discuss with their family. Um, you know, they're, they're having a little bit more time and it's, it's prompting a, a really great discussion. You know, when we do the consent process, they're calling back in, they're having questions, you know, in our office, our policy is we have a witness, you know, there's the person obtaining the consent, but then there's also a witness. So, you know, I've sat in on several of these informed consent discussions and I'm surprised that you know, how many, I, I do, I feel like it's, there's less pressure on them to try and come up with questions right now, like there is in the exam room. And I think that there are some actual benefits to this process. Shannon, yeah. I'll just jump in to this is, oh, sorry. I was just gonna, this is Sneha Fadke. I'm a clinical investigator. And I was just gonna say that I think that goes along with the, um, the telehealth um, aspect of, um, you know, the changes that occurred during the pandemic because sometimes I'll see a, a patient and I can't, I mean, we don't even have time to talk about clinical trials. And so it's a great um, tool to then be able to do like a video chat, you know, a couple of days later to just say, you know, these are the trials we have. And then, you know, that kind of goes along with the e-consent process. So I think that would be a really welcome addition um, to the, the clinical trials enrollment process. Thank you, Sneha. Yeah, it seems like, um, you know, this is such a new thing that just gathering kind of the experiences of everyone would be really helpful. And then, you know, ASCO or other organizations could think through what are the implications and, you know, what do we want informed consent to look like? You know, what pieces do we want to keep um, as we move forward? So this is helpful feedback to bring back to our group. Okay. Jared, I see your face popped up and I see a question from you here. So Jared asked, within the task force goals, who do you see leading the technology and integration strategy? And is this sponsors or who's doing this? Patricia, I know you've done more work at kind of exploring some of the technological issues. Do you want to respond? Yeah, I think um, that it would have to be well, I think there are so many, I think all of you know, there are so many vendors already out there and um, people who have various tools and um, technology um, to try to improve efficiencies and um, processes. But I think that without a doubt, I think the, one of the greatest challenges with those that already exist, typically developed by vendors or um, sponsors and even I know some CROs who have them. Um, the challenge has been that they've not consulted with trial sites or not consulted with the many um, types of trial sites that exist. And I'm sure even within mm -hmm. your network here, you've got um, different models and, um, you know, from the large academic centers to small community-based private practices who are doing research. And um, I think that is 
has been lacking. So I think um, I'm not, I would assume it's certainly, I can't imagine it being ASCO. So I would assume it would be vendors or industry and um, uh, industry sponsors and CROs who develop it. But I think the important um, message through any of our recommendations has been the need to consult with sites, the end user, um, because that has certainly been a limitation. Yeah, thanks so much for that. My head was swimming a little bit, um, trying to think of a way to ask that question um, because of what you just said. And I think our challenge, like as a, as a major academic institution, <clears throat> we purchase technology, then we get this site initiation platform from, you know, that you've mentioned in one of your slides. And then it's just another platform yeah. uh, with great intent, you know, to streamline mm -hmm. things, but now we have to upload between three of them. And I, and I just, I think we do get caught in this circular fashion of who's gonna do the integration. And um, right. I guess to your point, you know, I leave it at the vendors to find ways to create APIs to integrate, but if ASCO or others could make that a priority because this technology is fantastic as long as it talks to each other you know, safely. Yes. <laughs> and we're very supportive so of the critical. technology and know it's necessary, but I guess that would be one point I think in that task force to continue to echo is just what you just said. and and that we're very supportive and have engaged in e-binders, you know, the e-signature solutions, things like that, but to find the integ integration is still challenging. Yeah, and I think that is, the integration element is um, so key, especially since, as we mentioned previously, there are so many different platforms that exist. And um, so what's happening with the uh, Cognizant, the shared investigator platform, is many sponsors are using that one, but you know a, a CRO might have their own, another CRO might have their own. So it's not one um, system, which you know may never be one system, but they should be able to talk to one another. Or the site you guys can export a CSV file, and it can be uploaded in whatever way. So it's uh, it's a real problem, and hopefully our recommendations are going to stimulate that discussion and help make yeah, change. Really I think the technology that. is getting better too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we, in case it wasn't clear, the task force members are almost always our members. So folks like you, um, investigators as well as research administrators. So we're, these recommendations are coming from folks like you. So. Appreciate We've that. got your back. <laughs> We're trying to. Yeah, I, I know when I was looking at the options, the four options for the startup process, it, I just was thinking anything other than option one. I don't, I don't really care as long as it's not what we're doing right now, <laughs> because it does seem like a lot of things that we do are redundant and time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if we were all, able to speed that up, that would be excellent. And we'd be interested in hearing your ideas. I think that was a really great question in terms of, you know, how long before we'll see any changes. So I'd be interested if all of you have um, continued conversations and think of ideas that we can move that needle quicker um, other than, you know, the strategy to disseminate widely and potential collaborations. We'd really welcome them, I think. You know, your perspective is always um, invaluable. I will say from the University of Iowa, I mean, a lot of the things you've done have been initiating, you know, sometimes out of necessity because of COVID, right? But, uh, you know, the, the shorter um, site initiation visits, doing the things virtually, like we found success in creating like a pre-study team, kind of almost like a customer service team to better initiate conversation and get the ball rolling and kind of streamline that process. And then doing virtual, um, you know, tours of our cancer center. So showing all the equipment, standardizing, you know, off the checklist. So I, th I think sites, especially the academic sites need to, you know, do those sorts of things and they will help and, and follow that process. I think that the task force you guys have laid out. So. I think it's on all of us, but having the task work focus on those things and give us some set criteria will be very helpful um, to then for us to say, okay, this is what we, you know, we can, and I think we're trying to do that. So, um, 
It's exciting the, times. There's um, a lot of change. <laughs> yeah, um, right. I was I was also going to say that the research statement um, on the feasibility assessments does provide some site best best practices, but it's interesting because that was all created pre-COVID. So I'd be interested in your feedback, taking a look at that and seeing whether or not there are additional elements that could be um, added from the site perspective as well as sponsors and CROs. I know some feedback we've received from some of the research administrators and physicians um, has been that while a lot of the ideas to go remote for a lot of things has been great and, um, you know, the remote monitoring, all of that has been great. There have been now, um, or the past several months, have um, resulted in a lot of uh, challenges from sites in terms of seems like extra requests and documentation and all of that. So I think it'll be also interesting to hear that feedback as we move along, the continued feedback. Yeah, happy to do so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I learned something too. I think, Jared, the idea of a virtual tour is phenomenal. And that's definitely something that I think our site should do because so many of them that was used to be a part of the process was, you know, touring the lab, touring the chemo suites, touring our pharma research pharmacy. And there's just no reason that we couldn't put together a virtual tour and have it ready to send out at the startup process. So, awesome. Yeah, and we're very happy to share ideas within our own community or uh, what we've been finding successful. Also get yours as well, because we find it's very similar, I'm sure. Yeah. We're at 1257. How excited that are the virtual tours like a video that you create or it's actually done live? Oh, it'd be a, a pre recorded video. So we would go through and then, uh, yep. So that's basically the short answer. Sounds great. Yeah. Kelly, you want to close us out? You bet. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to our presenters. Thanks, Shannon, for facilitating. Thanks to folks for great questions. I just put two links in the chat box. The first is to a survey for today's session. If you would all, it's very short, very easy. If you would all take a moment to click on that and provide us some feedback, we really appreciate it. Um, the second is to our website. And I want to make a really important note communications about the, the content that this work group, our clinical trials and research work group puts on are available to members. So if your membership has lapped, you won't necessarily get the emails and we would hate for you to uh, miss out on that. So what that means is if you go to our website and need to renew your membership, you can do it for free or for $20, you can pick. Um, and that way your name can remain on our work group um, list and we can continue to have these great conversations. Thank you all so much. Um, Laura and Patricia, another big thank you to you. Hope everybody has a good day. Stay safe in the snow. <laughs>